if you're having on camera and you're falling in love every single time you're on camera, like legitimately falling in love, then you might not be in the right business. <laughs> I just put it that way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I get like having a moment of it, like wow, this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you're done, you're like, can we like get married now? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is considered one of the best actors in the adult industry. He started off his career by winning an AVN Award in 2011 for Best Male Newcomer, and he has not slowed down since. He has won too many awards to count, but you probably remember his 2023 double win for XBiz and AVN's Best Male Performer. He has moved to directing for Wicked and then started his own production company, Lucid Flicks, where he combines an artistic aesthetic with very intense hardcore scenes. This is a man that I personally adore, and I'm so happy to have him back here. Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, please. Welcome a true virtuoso of our industry, <laughs> the one and only Seth Gamble. Hi, Ellie. <laughs> 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 was that was that enough for you? It was uh, just a very it's a beautiful intro. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. So welcome, Ernie. I have to ask before we go any further. Can we see Seth's beautiful face without mic? Should he adjust the mic at all? Or are we good? Because it looks like it's very in front of his face. Yeah, no, no, he's, he's there. He's just. Uh, Do you want me to? No, 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 no. Like, like the only thing I would say is like lower, lower. Lower. swing it out a little yeah, bit. Like, okay, okay, that's fine if that feels comfortable for Hello. you. I couldn't tell from my angle, but we got them. I wanted to make sure. Okay. okay. Um, hi, Seth. Hello. How are you? Welcome back. I know. This is exciting. It's yeah. It's been a long time. I think uh, last time we did this together, me and you, uh, was uh, 2018. It was definitely before COVID. Yeah. Because so we still had the old time. studio. Yeah. So it's been a while. There's been a lot, a lot of things that have taken place over the past, I think that's been six years ago. Yeah. This, No. Five years ago? Five. Yeah, because I think the podcast has been going on for six years, right? So nine. So, yeah. So probably 19 then. We probably did this yeah. in 19. Yeah. Long yeah. time. Long. time. Long. Probably, right? 17? Yeah. 2017 is when we started. August 2017. Somebody else do the math. I just shoot porn. What do I know? <laughs> Don't make me do math. <laughs> you know? Um. So now we just wrapped up award season. Mm-hmm. Um, the AVNs are behind us. Yep. The Expos Awards are behind us. It's a very hectic month for a lot of performers, also sometimes an emotional month, either mm -hmm. good or bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you are a very celebrated performer with a lot of accolades. So I guess let's start from, you know, the, let's start actually with 2003, no, 2023. Yeah. Um, so everybody knows that you're one of the best actors in the industry. Like, honestly, like if you want, you have a role, you want some good acting. You, it's either like Seth Gamble, Tommy Pistol, or somebody else. <laughs> I can't think of. That's, uh, that's that's pretty. That's pretty accurate. It's been a, it's been a while since I've, it's, I've it's shot pretty a much, feature, but I think from like that perspective, and like you know, if you look at it from a, I guess, an award perspective, like me and Tommy have, yeah, have been. Uh, uh, just have been on top of that that game for a long time. Right. I think it's too, it's because we're both kind of trained as like real actors mm -hmm. and we both have like skill with that mm -hmm. in that area. Yeah. I don't know his level of uh, training. Mm -hmm. I actually like schooled for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've went to different teachers for it. Mm -hmm. um, I actually learned this skill. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that kind of gives me a little bit of um, a heads up and also uh, just it gives me the ability to play into roles and uh, I wouldn't say act. It's more just, I would just say I, I'm just really good at playing characters, finding a genuine version of them and trying to, I, I just enjoy that process playing different yeah. people. So it's always impressive to me because I'm literally the worst actress in the world. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I can't even remember like lines to a script that I wrote. Yeah. Like if I put myself yeah. in as an extra, cause I don't want to like pay somebody 150 bucks. I write the script and then I'm like, what are the lines again? And yeah. people are like, dude, you wrote it. I'm like, I know. The I memorization part's actually difficult for me as well. I mean, it's not easy memorization. It's just, especially 
it's just really, you know, you got to fine tune things. Some days you go to work and you can kind of understand what you're playing and then kind of go with it. And then when it's something a little more intricate, you know, I, I do tend to spend more time prepping mm -hmm. as an actor for it. So that yeah. way, cause I know what I'm getting myself into. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but in 2023, you know, we mentioned in the intro, yeah. you won Performer of the Year at yes. both ABN and Expos, mm -hmm. which is really a different kind of award. So, like, how did that make you feel? Um, it made me feel really grateful and also that um, I've always took pride in being as good of a performer as I am an actor. I think that you and I came in a time in the business where, like, and that's why you've said, oh, you're the best actor in the industry, but mm -hmm. I also... I feel like I've also put that much effort into my performing as well. But I think because we came in a time period where uh, it was a feature guy or a gonzo guy, yeah. that the separation, from, especially from your perspective, makes sense. Because mm -hmm. it was like, okay, well, Seth does these features. Then you have like John Strong here and he's like the strong mm -hmm. performer. Like I'm using him as an example because that right. would be where he stood those years ago. And I think that there came a point in time, uh, I would say around 2014, 13, 14, where uh, Xander and I, at the same Xander Corvus at the time, we were both younger guys who really wanted to like, we were both feature guys. We always mm -hmm. did the, the features, the wicked stuff, the vivid stuff, the Adam and Eve stuff, you know, the bigger movies. And it was more like along the lines of like, we wouldn't be put in those situations. So me and him started getting work for kink and then like evil. And then these things were happening. And I think, uh, I really take a lot of pride and, uh, gratitude in the fact of I've been able to create a very versatile, uh, type of career so mm -hmm. I, I really I really really put a lot of emphasis in like the, the guy who taught me how to be a performer was like uh, was like Mark Davis and the guys I watched coming into the business I started like really focusing on who was very very like known for performing is like Manuel Ferrara these are guys that like I kind of looked at as like you know or Eric Everhard like these guys really were holy shit like they they were really coming off the screen and, and just seeing like understanding their process mentally on on how they come through a scene or just learning my own process, trying to figure out how to do it on my own and just seeing them actually be like, wow, Seth's like, you know, the performer all around um, uh, really was a feeling of um, like, I guess like, wow, okay. So I'm the, I'm really, you really see me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, really yeah, what totally. it was. Because at the end of the day, like the acting part was like, I, I feel at that time period, I really leaned into that lane. That's mm -hmm. why it was, like I leaned in as hard as I could at being the actor mm -hmm. because I felt like the other one was impossible. Mm. I don't believe that. Were you surprised? Um, yes and no. Um, I had a really insane year that year. Like 2023 20, was insane. Like if you look at the nominations, mm -hmm. uh, there were 10 movies. Mm -hmm. I, le I starred in eight and I directed one. Wow. Of the movies of the year. Right. right so right. I was the lead of all of those movies. Wow. And then I directed one. And then I was nominated in every category, sex-wise. Mm -hmm. I was nominated as an actor in all the categories. Um, so I just, I really got fortunate to do a lot of amazing projects that year. Um, and also, like, I'd have that, I've had that before. It just really, I don't know, the stars aligned for them to, you know, really do it. And I feel like, you know, you know, even seeing this year, like, you know, guys like myself looking at Isaiah, seeing like Tommy Pistol win that award over the last, you know, that's been the last three winners of that award. And it's just. <laughs> I love Tommy Pistol's like acceptance speech. Yeah, yeah. He was like, you don't have to be have a big dick yeah, to be performer you know I mean? of the year. I was like, <laughs> and, oh, my God. And I think it's just like really seeing that the all around <laughs> performer, because that's what the word means. It yeah. used to just mean like you're the best. I don't know. if No, I, I think it was, it's always meant that. But meaning like. It just, it veered more towards the guys that are just like really hard evil angel yeah. guys. It was yeah. always that way. And I, I look up to both that, that way. You know what I mean? I, I've just loved all the aspects of the industry, yeah. but I really, I really honestly had a chip on my shoulder about being a performer because it's always been like, you're the best actor in the world. But it's like, yeah, I do. I'm not a, but I'm, a, but I'm also I'm, like I'm a performer. Star. Like, yeah, and right. I take a lot of pride in that. Like, yeah. that's why like, you know, the movies I make, um, it's all about like, you know, really showing intensity and chemistry in a scene. And that's really, and also being able to like ballet with the girl to make her look as good as possible in a scene. That's like always been my focus. And what I feel is the focus of being a great performer mm -hmm. and to be recognized for that by both uh, award shows was just like, uh, it was just mind blowing. I was grateful for it. I put the work in yeah, and um, just really grateful for those who sat around supporting me and, I'm really glad that I get to be there and support others. Yeah. So, so um, 
You know that I love to tease you about scooping up multiple awards at these <laughs> events. I was giving you shit in the red carpet line. I seem to get a lot of <laughs> But I mean, obviously, I can imagine, and I can only imagine because I am not a big award winner, um, that despite the obvious pleasure you get for having your work recognized, is there like an element of discomfort about it? You know, like, does that number of accolades make you feel like, like pressure to continue to set the bar like incredibly high and like you're are you worried that you might have a year that like you don't win like a lot or something like that like or is it all just like great i have my work recognized and you can accept that like is there any mixed feelings on that i guess i think when i was younger um like during the process of like after because i started in, in adult in 06 mm -hmm. and then i won newcomer in 11 mm -hmm. which you know because i didn't get to la to like I don't know, 08, 09, and then finally work started coming out. So you make sense that the 2010 year made sense why mm -hmm. that was the year. 2011, you know how it works. Yeah, yeah. You work in 2010, and then 11 is where that work gets recognized. Right, because so it's, it's in not, January. It's not really like relative to when you got in the industry. It's the year. Yeah, which is yeah. always like a little bit confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because my Florida to career like doesn't count when you get to L.A. Like it doesn't count. Florida, you don't count. No. When it comes to like <laughs> like awards. Right. It's like that. All that work I put in in Florida wasn't like being you're not in the big t at that time. You were in the big yeah. town pool in yeah, L.A. Yeah. Um, the sites you were shooting for weren't really perpetual, like finding that DVD VOD world because that's all that really was back then. It was right. So much. Uh, there was still internet, but it wasn't really being seen. It was definitely like the movie had to come out on DVD. Yeah. Or, Otherwise, and, you weren't yeah. going to get recognized. So yeah. I think when I was younger, I really cared about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I still like seek for it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I like I'm I'm an athlete. Like I've grew up an athlete. I played sports. I I have that that mentality of trying to um, always do more, better. Like mm -hmm. I never will have that. As you know, as now addict, the recovering addict, I, nothing will ever as like I reach a mountain and I'm like oh there's more mountain mm -hmm. like that's just how I I see it like I always see my life that way there's yeah. nothing to do with so much awards like awards I'm so grateful that you know AVN XBiz XRCO Night Moves all these award shows um, you know all the ones that are out there if they they recognize me each year and stuff like that but really they just seeing the nominations is just like really cool to me and I think I've done so well with that also it's like I just really at this point in my career want to make really cool stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I really want to see, I want to make projects where people are getting to do them and they kind of, I've seen a lot, I've seen some of that in the last few years, like people I've worked with or I've directed or I've made, I've, yeah, I've directed or been in the movie with them as a director or something like that. They win an award for that is like the, that feeling at this point in my career is where it's gratifying. But pressure, I wouldn't know if, I don't think the awards bring me pressure. I think I just bring myself pressure. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that have to keep trying to, like I said, like climbing higher. It's just mm -hmm. how I am. Yeah. So. Um, I want to ask you about losing. Okay. Um, because, you know, I see every year the awards come around and I see you know, so many people get hopeful um, and then they lose yes. and then they're like devastated. Like, mm -hmm. and they take to Twitter and they're like, it's not fair. Da, 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 da. And um, as somebody who, <laughs> not to make this pretty but who often loses <laughs> awards myself <laughs> and who only got my very first AVN this year and it was for Hall of Fame. And I truly believe it was because I told Todd, I'm like, Todd, you got to talk to him. I'm like, it's 25 years. Like, I'm due, man. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Todd. Uh, but, uh, you know, I and then Hopeless won Best Feature, which was amazing. But that wasn't even me. That was fucking Jeff. Like, that was Jeff's movie. Jeff did everything. I just like threw my name and some money at it. Um, but, you know, I honestly feel like <laughs> I'm so used to like losing that like I've become really good at it and this actually like goes back to this is so stupid but this goes back to so I rode horses competitively when I was young and I had this Arabian horse named Vicky who would like fucking refuse every single jump I did three-day eventing and I used to like get eliminated constantly and my mom would make me go to all these horse shows and I would lose or get I mean like all the time like it was crazy and even though like obviously at the time it was very difficult especially like you know I'm like 11 years old um, I feel like that was actually a really good experience for me because mm -hmm. I feel like I've become like I'm 
good at losing. <laughs> like I, I and I tell you, like this is like a great skill to have. I really because anybody can win, yeah. right? Like that's easy to win. Like to win, like oh great, everybody loves me. But to lose and to lose with grace yeah. is very difficult. And I feel like I, I. <laughs> I've learned that skill very well. So, um, like, how do you handle disappointment of not winning an award that, like, maybe something that you really put your heart and your soul into? Like, how does how does that feel for you? Well, I just never stop till I won it. Mm. I thought you were just going to say, "Well, I've never lost." <laughs> no, I just, like, I, I've yeah. lost a million times. Yeah, I, I I don't know if I believe I. It's actually on the top of my Twitter thing. It's like I never lose; I always learn. Mm -hmm. Right? It's kind of like like there's no. That's like my my uh, my my saying like. I've been trying to win Male Performer of the Year since 2006. Yeah. I didn't win it till 2023. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I've lost a million times. You know, if I really wanted to focus on which award was the thing I had to win, mm -hmm. then I would, I would have, I would have crawled back into my hole every fucking year. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if I cursed, if that's probably. No, you Okay. I don't know. Of course but no, but that's the thing. I don't really look at it that way. Like mm -hmm. I, 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 yes, I have, I have before. There was one year, um, I was the lead in Star Wars, Triple mm -hmm. X. And it, at the time, was, I don't know where the numbers are today, but it is the number one selling DVD of all time. Mm -hmm. I'm the lead of the movie. Um, doesn't even make the screen. And not only did I not win, it didn't even go on to the, the screen, mm -hmm. which you find out, like, some of that's just the stuff put, stuff they put in the show. It really doesn't have any relativity to, like, where the voters felt or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But still, at that time, I was young. I was, like, 22 years old. And that felt, like, really crappy because I was like, well, look, what this movie did and it's it's you know very well watched and da, da, da. And I know I played the role really well and it is what it is but um, that was the one time that really taught me a lesson and it was just like you know at the end of the day I never I just don't give up like it's just not like it motivates me so it does motivate it you. motivate it's just it doesn't that doesn't make I don't like awards happen and it's like all right let's go let's make something crazy like let's just I don't have that propensity to like sit there and dwell on something I felt because I Look, I work a lot. I have a really great job. I get to be creative. I get to work with some of the best people in the world. Um, I'm still holding on to my looks at this age, which mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not that old, but you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm still, I'm healthy. Um, what did I really lose? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I know that sounds like really maybe cliche or like I'm trying to be that way. And it's disappointing. Don't get me wrong. But I think at the end of the day, like, um, really truly than like getting nominations and seeing like especially being now being a performer director writer actor mm -hmm. all those things seeing getting the, the nominations seeing all these people that get nominations around stuff you're working on and, and seeing it recognized in that way if you win it's just icing on the cake you know yeah I, and i have look it's easy for me to say because i have won a lot of awards but i've always i've just i pushed and pushed until i got I never gave up. Like I just never, I never looked at it like I lost. Oh my God. You know, a lot of times you lose and you just kind of, a lot of, like, a lot of times it's easy just to be like, well, I'm not going to try anymore. Mm -hmm. What's the point? Mm -hmm. That's like a very common way to look at it. I've just, mm -hmm. I just never have. I don't look at it like, what's the point? It's like, okay, let's try it again this year. Let's try it again this year. It's like mm -hmm. a video game. Like, okay, this game's over. Let's play a new game. Let's yeah. try a new game. Let's try a new game. And it's just, it's just continuing to just deliver high quality product and high quality thing. Because for me, it's less about like having you know, the greatest amount of awards, it's like, what kind of legacy do I leave in this business? Mm -hmm. And that's really, sorry, and it might be a long-winded no, 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 I mean, we're, we're here to listen to you talk, not <laughs> as much as I like to talk. Um, so that actually leads me, I mean, you just talked about a legacy, like, so now that you're directing and that's becoming such a big part of your career, mm -hmm. do you think that like moving forward, you might be like more emotionally attached to like winning directing awards than like performing awards? Because it's a different kind of, job right I, I don't know like I, I think that obviously why wouldn't I want to win that you know mm -hmm. like I of course I want to win. everybody wants to win let's mm -hmm. be realistic I yeah. want to win yeah it'd be ridiculous not to but with directing it's just a different energy about it like I yeah. love performing and directing the same amount like they're they're both loves that mm -hmm. I love like I never thought that I feel that way about directing but honestly making stuff and having like i'm very privileged and I, I pretty much get to create mental like my own mind and work with collaborators people that i'm really excited about making things and like seeing the girl being on set so excited to look the way she does and play the role she does or do the things they do like and make something that people are like wow this looks really good and i'm really the, the talent's really happy about being in it that's really what I'm, that gets me going about directing. Mm -hmm. So the idea of winning awards for it's like, I have won a few actually. I won director of the year for Night Moves. Um, I've won uh, Sex Scene this year, won for 
uh, movie I directed for um, uh, Pure Taboo, and then I'd also won a screenplay for AVN for something I wrote, co-wrote with Brie, and then uh, Blake Blossom won a tease for one of the scenes I did, and Julia Ann won a non-sex performance for one of the movies I did. Mm-hmm. So it's like seeing those things, it's just such a grati- gratifying feeling. Because then like you get to like include other people in that win, right? Yeah, like, I'm, like, my, like a, my yeah. effort with these people collaborating with them they get to feel what I feel felt because I it feels great to win awards, but yeah. it's like it feels so much better to watch these people I love working with get it, and we, because it's something we did together. Yeah, from nothing we created it from literally thin air from my brain and from their their perspective on what's in my brain. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's like that's such a cool thing. So for me, directing is like really like even why you know uh, created you know trying to create genres and being doing exciting things. It's like. Sure, do I want accolades for them? Do, do I want my team to get accolades? Do I want the talent to get accolades? Yes, of course, but like, I don't know, this idea of just being able to like make porn my way is just super dope to me. So yeah. that's the part that I'm really focusing on. Having so. that, having creative control over the product that you're making is like almost, I wouldn't, okay, so obviously not unheard of, but that's, it's very difficult to get to that level. Yeah, like, I was very fortunate. Because I, people aren't just gonna throw money at you and be like, do whatever you want. Yeah, no, exactly. But it's, it's, I'm giving ideas in the company. They're like, oh, this is a good idea. You know, we were like, or the idea is that like, you know, and, and, you know, early on when I started directing, this is like, you know, Axel and Brie Mills and, you know, the team at Gamma who really just like, were like, let's give this a shot and see what this looks like. And things started getting viewed and sold. Yeah. Stuff was getting viewed and sold. Like, that's the other part. Like, awards are great, but I want my shit to sell. Yeah, I want people to watch it. It could be the greatest movie no one ever watched. What yeah, does that matter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why does it matter if no one's really cares about it? Yeah, you know what I mean, you have to have. An, we work in a business, and we have to look at this as a business, and we have to be like, okay, how do I make something great, but also something that viewers want to watch? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we are going to be right back. So stick around. Hello, my beautiful listeners. Have you ever wondered how to spice things up and bring a new level of excitement into the bedroom? Well, I've found the perfect secret for you and your partner. Introducing Popstar for bigger loads and better taste. Yes, ladies, I said better taste. We've talked about how a man's diet can affect his uh flavor. And while this is your alternative to drinking gallons of pineapple juice, Seriously though, Popstar is an organic, high quality enhancer that's made with love in the USA. Quality ingredients such as L-arginine and zinc have been shown to improve semen health, erections, and testosterone production. Together, these ingredients will help you level up your sexual experience and maximize your ejaculation and orgasm. Imagine feeling more intense sessions, feeling more connected, and experiencing pleasure like never before. That's the Popstar promise. It's not just about impressing your partner. It's about enhancing those intimate moments that are so precious to us all. Popstar has hundreds of five-star reviews. And if you're not completely satisfied, they offer a money-back guarantee. Yes, you heard that right. It's completely risk-free. Now, here's something special for our listeners. Use the code HOLLY when you order and get an extra 20% off of your first auto-ship order. Just visit popstarlabs.com slash holly or search for Popstar Pills on Amazon. And don't just take my word for it. Try Popstar and feel the difference yourself. Trust me, you and your partner are in for an unforgettable experience. All right, everybody, we are back. So on to my favorite topic. Not everybody's favorite topic, but my favorite topic. Sobriety. Yeah. Uh, so, Seth, you've been very open about being a recovering addict and yes. alcoholic. We've discussed how you got sober in our previous interview. So yes. if you guys want to know that story, go back and watch it. I'm yes. not going to re- rehash that. <laughs> it's a lot. But um, do you find that addiction finds its way back into your life through other avenues, like perhaps work? Absolutely. A hundred percent. But it's what that's what addiction is. Right. You know, we always that's the idea of being having, you know, an addiction, an addict's brain. It's like we're we're always going to subconsciously try to find something to obsess over. It's really what it all comes down to. Right. So I think it also becomes a superpower. Mm. If you're not really your propensity for wanting to get loaded has been dissipated. Mm-hmm. You can, but it also the superpower could also become like a problem. Because you're also like become addicted to something else and you're not finding it. You know, I think sobriety is just a constant journey of finding balance. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to. And sometimes we 
decide to not be balanced in certain areas of our life, but how do we like keep ourselves in check and mm -hmm. like make sure that we're, you know, finding that peace that we yeah. need to be able to not be, you know, doing this with our brains because it's kind of like one of those kind of rat races. Yeah, and it, it's interesting. I like that you said that it's a journey because I, you know, a lot of people who don't know much about addiction or are um, um, critical of like, you know, rehab or a 12 step program or something like that, they're like, something like that. They're like, oh, it doesn't work, you know? And it's like this idea that you go in, you go into rehab and you like go there for 30 days and like you're cured and like it's over and like then, then it's fine. You can go back to being the way you are, but like, that's not true. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's a lifetime yeah. of trying to like manage that demon that basically like is just running around in our brain going like, how can I destroy your life? How can I destroy your life? You know? Yeah. And it's not, yeah, no, hundred percent. And it's not about <laughs> the, the thing is it's it, it the second you, if you can get off of stuff, mm -hmm. whatever your thing is, that's not even the problem. Yeah. And that's the thing that it, it's hard to. That's the coping mechanism yeah. to deal with the problem. No matter what that thing is. Yeah. It could be work, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be, be gambling, it could be sex, it could anything. be. Anything. Food. Food. It could exercise. Be any, anything it could be, right? Yeah. And porn. Anything you could do, porn, anything. anything. And, and it's not, the thing isn't the addiction. And yeah. that's the thing that people like, we can't, no matter how we, we could sit here and explain this for like eight hours and like a lot of people will be like, I don't I don't understand it. And the truth is, it's just you could stop doing the things that you're doing, but you now have taken away your solution. So you need to find another solution. It doesn't matter if that's the program or therapy or whatever. The thing is, you need a solution to the solution. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know what I mean, so in order to live a sustainable life, that's has some version of health to it, because you could be I mean, I've been there. I've been uh, I've been sober, uh, you know, physically. Um, you know, not doing anything or putting self, anything in my body, but not doing any of the work that gets me there. What am I? I'm irritable. I'm restless. I'm, there's some behaviors that might come up even when I was, you know, messed up because it's the sobriety. The, the addiction starts when you stop doing the drugs. Mm -hmm. That's when you have to you're like, why did you do the drugs? I didn't make a choice to get high when I was high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The choice was made when I was not high. Yeah. Yeah. So if you really put it in perspective, it's like I didn't go. I wasn't high. You know, some people 24 hours a day, sure. But, but, you know, but meaning like when that moment is, I'm like. You had I'm, moments of sobriety when you chose. Yeah. Every time you're clear alcohol. of mind, you're like, I'm going to go ahead and drink. Yeah. You didn't do that when you were drinking. Yeah. You were at one point, you might have been not drinking for an hour and you were like, I want to drink. Yeah. And then you get into the spiral. But, yeah. you know, it, it's such a loaded thing to talk about, you know, and it's sad. There's a lot of uh, it, it's just really sad if you know the percentages of, of people that can actually find what we have found. Yeah. yeah. And it, that's another interesting thing, too, that I have. I hear people say and I see people say all the time, like, well, you know, like statistically, like people relapse after like, you know, going into like a 12 step program or whatever. I'm like, where are you getting these numbers from? Because, you know, that like we don't keep records of that shit. So this whole like whole statistically, like 95 percent of people relapse. It's like. Where, where, where do you get those numbers from? Yeah. Because like there's there's literally like no numbers. Well, there's no numbers based on like going to a program. That's what I'm but, saying. But in, in rehab, the number, yeah, sure. the number of people statistically that relapse is that is true, but mm -hmm. not based on who uses the program. It's right, based right. on like the reality of the people who go into like a rehab facility yeah, or a detox help. versus yes. like, I guess versus who comes back, right? Because yeah. you don't know if somebody relapses statistically, unless they come back. Yes, so 5% so sustain a lifelong journey of sobriety. Yeah. Which is, that sounds about accurate actually, if you really that think about it. That does sound about accurate. It's about accurate. So let's say um, you can Wild. make a choice to be that 5% mm -hmm. or you can be in that 95%. Yeah. Are you, do you, can you find enough will or find some other type of will mm -hmm. to some degree to be like, I am that 5%. Because mm -hmm. that's really what this comes down to. I have to like get being sober and doing a lot of like affirmation work, and meditation. You have to find a way to have that. F you have to be able to believe in yourself. And sometimes that takes a lot of support of people believing in you. Yeah. You know, that's true. And that's really what it comes down to for me, at least that's my experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned earlier about like, you know, have you been physically sober, but not, as we say, like emotionally sober. Yes. Um, and you actually uh, you kind of publicly apologized vaguely on social media about being different lately. Yeah. Do you remember that? And you said you were kind of being, you're being more proactive to change whatever unfavorable behavior you noticed uh -huh. in yourself. 
Can you talk a little bit more in de about that in however much detail you want, uh -huh. obviously? Um, because I'm particularly interested in the concept of self-awareness yeah. and how you try to write yourself when you see yourself acting in a way that you don't like. Yeah, and honestly, I don't... I just felt that I put a lot... I have a lot on my plate. Mm -hmm. And over last year, I did put a lot of pressure on myself. Like, mm -hmm. I was launching a company. Um, I have a lot of personal things with family that... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really want to like. I don't really know if I want to del delve into. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. Like, um, understood. Uh, family members sick. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, probably the closest family member that mm -hmm. you could have is sick. Yeah, I'll say that uh, terminally. Mm -hmm. So I found that out last year, and um, I I didn't know how to process it at first. Yeah. And just being busy with everything and trying to make sure I get everything done and showing up right. I always mm -hmm. have to show up. It's something that I've burned into my memory mm -hmm. almost traumatically. Like when I got sober, like showing up's important. But, yeah, um, I always say I'm almost like, uh, what's the word? I am um, like painfully, uh, oh my God, what is the word? Uh, fuck. It's, it's something like, like I'm like painfully like reliable or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like yeah. I'm just it's like, like, like if I say I'm going to do something. I like, have to do it. Like I hold myself to like the standard of yeah. like I have to like follow through. Like, and I, think, I just like beat myself up around and it. And I think that's a lot of what it was going through as well. It's yeah. like I beat myself up a lot and like I just – I went through so many years like in sobriety in life just like doing all the things. But like things got really busy last year so I felt like I got – a little bit on burnout, so mm -hmm. it was a little more like I had the less of the pause. Mm -hmm. So I was like really in that when I posted that, it was like more like I just hold myself accountable. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I did some extravagant, ex exuberant yeah, 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 thing. Yeah. Like most people are like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" No, you I know, get that. I get you know. I got that. That that's why I wanted to ask because when yeah, I yeah. read that, I totally understood what you meant. Yeah. Because I f feel the same way often. Like I notice unfavorable behaviors, yeah. Yeah. and I. Uh, you know, like, especially when I'm busy, like, I don't hold myself accountable. And then I feel guilty about it. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I'm like, I know I'm kind of acting shitty. Yeah. And maybe, like, other people aren't seeing it so much. But, like, I see it. Yeah. And, like, this is not good. I think also as an alcoholic and an addict, there's certain behaviors that I'm just not. Like, most people are, like, they don't even see it as a thing. Yeah. And, like, I feel like I have to hold myself accountable for them because I have to be able to, like, understand and be self-aware of them because I'm not allowed to have those behaviors. Yeah. Like I don't allow my, like it happens because I'm not a perfect person. I'm yeah. far from perfect. I have yeah. a lot of flaws, but I feel that I have to be a little more self-aware because it could lead me into a really bad place. Yeah. And that's really where it comes down to it. So there's behaviors that a lot of my friends, you know, in the business you would say would probably, I would just give them a behavior and they'd be like, that's normal. Everybody does that. Yeah. But I can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. especially with the responsibilities that I hold in general, mm -hmm. nothing crazy. Maybe it was just to me, like being irritable or like, like even saying something involving gossip. Like mm -hmm. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like I don't do that. So if there's a moment where I'm talking about it with someone, it's like, wait, hold on a second. I'm like getting sucked into this vortex that I, I'm yeah. not allowed to get sucked. I caught, I caught myself on that like a while ago and I had to like apologize to that person. Yeah. You know like what I, mean? I should not have said those things. Like I didn't mean to say something that made you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. I thought it was at the time. I thought it was important that you knew. But like now, looking back, like I, I feel like I shouldn't have said that. And he just looked at me like I was insane. It was like yeah, was because okay. everybody because we're so in a field yeah. of work that everybody just just normal. Yeah, and I was like, but that's not like who I am. Exactly. Like, I really that. like try to hold back. Yeah. If you tell me something shitty about somebody, I will almost never repeat it to that person because like. The only thing that's going to do is make that person feel bad. Yeah. And it's also you know? like to like, you know, there's very I don't have a lot of really, really, really close people in my life. Yeah. And, um, you know, times I let people in and they become the wrong person. Yeah. Instead of getting bitter about it, I just go, OK, I'm never going to I'm never going to I'm never going to allow one person or some person that comes into my life to make me change my own character. Yeah. You know what I mean? So but I'm not also going to put my arm up to people anymore mm -hmm. like I mean when I was younger I think I did that a lot now it's more like I'm willing to accept this and trust this mm -hmm. and now you have the opportunity to hold that trust or break that trust mm -hmm. and sometimes too like you're just venting so you need to find those people maybe it's a therapist maybe it's a friend maybe it's mm -hmm. but it's hard because in this industry it's very you know insular to little talks and yeah. stuff like that and it's just dumb little things that I just you know usually like um, I'm just coming to a time in my life where I just need to make sure that 
I just like holding my, I guess it's just like holding myself accountable. And yeah. just, I want to keep growing. I don't want to like, I don't want to stay in the same place. So sometimes like, it's good for me to be like, hey, I'm acknowledging that I've not, I've been less than perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? On top of it. Cause you know, at the end of the day too, it's like, I don't like being the person. I don't want to just give you an overview of like, oh, look at all my success. Mm-hmm. I want to let you know, hey, look, I'm also a person that mm-hmm. works my ass off, like mm-hmm. to a point where sometimes it's unhealthy. Yeah. And also, I'm a person that genuinely cares more than I care to admit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons I had a hard time getting sober. Mm-hmm. So when I got sober, I was like, God damn, I care. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, all, I care. All those emotions that yeah, you can no you know longer I mean? like push down with drugs or alcohol. And, and now admit, you got to deal with them. And admitting that I care makes me care less. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, those are just a few of the things that it was about. And just like, honestly, it's just me. It's not a New Year's resolution thing. It was not, nothing like that. It's just like I felt in that moment. Uh, I wasn't feeling my best. I was going through a rough place. I was launching a company. I had some personal stuff going on. I had a lot, a lot on my shoulders mm-hmm. and it was getting really, really overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And I felt that I could be very like, what are you talking about? Like, what are the, like, it was yeah. very like, that's how I felt. I felt everything felt so intense. Yeah. So I felt like people aren't used to that version of me anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's something they were used to when I was in my early 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like, whoa, who's this new guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Either who's this new guy? Why is this guy back? You know, yeah. depending on how long you've known me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Oh my so God. That's pretty much just the take on it, so. So since we're on the subject of addiction, um, we lost some really important people in the industry last month. It was yeah. like very, very sad. Um, you know, Jesse Jane. Um, what do you think about drugs in the adult industry. Like, because, you know, there's a lot, there's that, there's this, con- there's this idea that there's a lot of drugs in the industry. Everybody who's in the industry is on drugs because, you know, there's that whole idea that like you could never do porn unless you were fucked up because it's a terrible thing to do and everybody hates it. Um, do you think that, that there's as big of a drug problem in the adult industry as like it, it tends to be shown in mainstream media? Um, no. And I'll tell you why I don't think that. I think that no matter what field you're in, if you're a part of entertainment, people party. Yeah. It's what it is. You're in the entertainment business. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just like the culture of the business? Or do I you think, think it's, it's the, the culture people, of the entertainment? Kind of people that are attracted to it? Yeah, it's just the culture of entertainment. It's the people that are in entertainment. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it, it think about tend it. to be more social, outgoing people. people so, socializing, going out, drinking, stuff like that. It's like you're going to events. It's like it's a very... That's what entertainment is. Right. Like you, it's part of the job. Right. It's not. And and uh, weirdly enough, like I feel like adult has now meshed into this. Like I don't even know if you can call them celebs, but it's like you know, there's the movie stars and mm-hmm. the massive music artists, mm-hmm. and now there's an entire world of this pseudo celeb that's YouTube. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like YouTubers, the YouTube celebrities, and mm-hmm. like influencers, and this world. So that almost like influencer, YouTuber, adult film is like all mixed together now. Mm-hmm. It's like one whole little box. They are all interviewing adult film people. They're all in somewhat connected to it, or they're the complete opposite, and it's more like very religious, very, very that way, right? But it's it's very meshed together. So I feel like throughout all of those, with music, with any time of entertainment, you know, it it's just a part of it, but. It's very simple. People like to – sex is a very hard thing to talk about for people. Mm-hmm. It's it's never been this publicly accepted uh, thing. It's, it's you know, we're, we're socially conditioned over time with religion and the way people think about religion to, um, you know, look down upon sex that is had outside of marriage. Mm-hmm. That's like – that's the socially – acceptable thing that has been this way for hundreds and hundreds of years and even sex inside of marriage people don't talk about yeah exactly so it's like it, the idea of a group of people that are willing to have sex on camera and monetize it for people who have their own fetishes and stuff like that is really a tough pill for people to swallow yeah well that's actually a funny pun because we're talking about drugs <laughs> but uh the, but uh what i'm saying is no i don't believe that it's as big of a problem i think that uh, what do you think the? I mean, let me ask you a question. What do you think the average age of a young person who gets into like going out and partying is? I mean, I started doing that when I was sixteen. Okay, but like generally between like the eighteen to twenty-eight range, people are going out enjoying themselves, right? I mean, twenty twenty-one, right? right? As soon as you're like legally able to go to bars. Yeah, yeah. So like, 
the getting, majority getting away of the, from your parents you're majority like, of the people in our industry are like are that age? 18 26 yeah, going out partying yeah. they just happen to make a little more money regardless if it was adult or not yeah and you know you're getting to experiment but these girls seem to get a little bit of fame and then things happen and then it's like oh look what happened here you know and yeah. i also believe that like there are people in the world that happen to have addiction so yeah. it's just we're very microscoped because they're always looking to microscope us for the negative right so it's like let's open up that door and it's con that's why it seems the way that they want to make it seem that way right it's like they don't right. want it to be like look how great porn is like yeah. let's you should go there <laughs> like that's not how society is look looking. at this person who goes does a porn teen and then goes home and feeds their dogs and watches netflix and goes to bed yeah like they don't want to glamour i like yeah it's cool you don't you don't get tmz like routine, writing about that my routine would be like damn can't get that's not that exciting <laughs> i just make things exciting yeah i don't like do that things that yeah, yeah, yeah. I also live that part of my life it's like my yeah. second life at this point but so do you think that doing porn can exacerbate a drug problem like say you come into the industry you might have a tendency towards addiction um, or you've you know you've experienced a little bit of that do you think that coming into porn can actually make it worse um, yes and no because it's like you know I think that I, I'm an addict I came in the business and I already had the trauma I already had the addiction Right. Right. So I think that I think that anybody who comes into a world and makes more money than they're, they're supposed to at a younger age mm -hmm. will have the propensity to spend money in any way mm -hmm. it is to celebrate and engorge in that lifestyle. But then it's also the idea, though, I think the thing that people really cling to is the idea that, you know, porn is something that really takes away like your integrity and makes you feel terrible about yourself, right? Like you're doing something that you know is wrong in that moment. And so you use drugs and alcohol to like push those feelings down. Do you think that there's anything to that? Like you come into the porn industry with trauma and then being in the porn industry just makes that trauma worse. It could, I mean, if trauma. you haven't, I mean, that's the thing. It's not like people are getting into industries knowing they're being self-aware of whatever trauma. It's like, yes, of course, if you've been living You've been you're 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 born, and then as life continues, you're like this thing is a, um, this thing is bad. This thing is bad. This thing is bad. This is thing is bad. Oh, you're doing this bad thing. Then there's that guilt that lies in the back of your mind. So then when you do the thing, you feel worse because you know it's the bad thing. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't become aware that this was being told to you and that's not okay, then yes, you're gonna exacerbate whatever issue that is. And mm -hmm. drug addiction could be that thing. So I I do believe that it does happen because that's not. Um, Yes. I, yeah, of course that could happen. But generally speaking, I feel that it does take a lot of work. It does take, even for myself, it takes a lot of work to make sure that uh, I stay grounded to to be able to look at this as a profession and not just look at this as like just a, you know, mm -hmm. fun free for all to party. Yeah. I think, it, it, I think what you just pointed out is something that a lot of people have a hard time grasping is that like everybody's different. Yeah. And everybody sees sex and sexuality differently so you're right somebody could come into the porn industry who was raised in an environment that they were told sex was bad and and horrible yes and then they could be doing this thing and they feel guilt and shame about it yes. and that make gets worse over time or there are people who come into the industry and i've talked to both kinds that they come in with this you know same thing taught sex is bad and they should feel guilty but they find that it doesn't do that and actually they feel liberated by it yeah. now they're in a community of people who enjoy sex and they're not being shamed for it anymore and they're being embraced and they're being um they're getting accolades for it and they're being rewarded for it yeah. so they're like oh this is actually freeing for me like yes. and they go the opposite way so i think it's just like it's who who are you everybody's different everybody's like, there's no different. like there's no like generic way of putting what the, <laughs> it's like uh it's no difference like anything it's like this industry doesn't do anything to you it's how you can handle any pressures of anything yeah and there are a lot more pressures of putting yourself out there on camera in any degree yeah so at the end of the day what it really will test where you're at yeah. And I, no matter what, and it, it's actually for me a great gauge. Like last year, being able to be self aware, it's like, oh, wait, I'm gauging something off here mm -hmm. because of the world we live in. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things that I have to like combat or be that way because at the end of the day, it's like, it's the, uh, the idea of it. And plus, like, we are a bubbled industry. Mm -hmm. It's very bubbled. It's less bubbled than it was before. It was yeah. way more tighter than it was, but yeah. it's a little bubbled. So, you know, it, a lot of inner, inner talking, inner thing. It's like a very inner, you know, kind of thing. So, 
Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think you could kind of generalize anything about the industry itself because everybody's different. Yeah, you know, me yeah. and you are sitting here sober, sober as gophers, whatever you want to say. <laughs> sober as uh, gophers. Uh, <laughs> it's a forty <laughs> quote, by the way. It's not like I didn't make that up. Okay, so somebody so, actually has said that. Yeah, you didn't just it's make a rap that up. Song. It's in a rap song. It's called "Yup and Nope" by uh, E Forty. Oh. He was sober as a gopher. Oh wow. He's like. He's like, yeah, it's funny. Uh, that is funny. So, uh, but yeah, what I mean is it's like, you know, you, you can make a choice and some people, uh, everybody's different. You know, yeah. I just get re really easy about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody is different. Um, so you've recently moved to directing as, yes. as we've mentioned. So what prompted that shift? Um, well, I, you know, I started working with Gamma, um, you know, I, you know, on a, on a, on a, we have a term that we're with that we're working on and um you know I'm with the company and uh early on when they first decided to do that one of the the big things they were talking about doing was like letting me take a shot at directing and at the time for wicked axel braun was uh doing head of production work and him and jessica and dom and all agreed that i should make a movie mm -hmm. and i was like Okay, of what? <laughs> like, I was like, what do you mean? So I didn't realize the privilege so at the time. So they came to you with the idea. You didn't even ask for it. No, well, they offered me the, once we started working together, they offered me the prospect of directing. Okay, so it wasn't your idea to start off with? Or was yeah, it? It was something I was interested in, mm -hmm. but it was like, hey, this is what we're offering you and you could get a chance to direct if that's something you're interested in. Okay, gotcha. Oh yeah, that would be great. Okay. I'd, lo I'd love to try that. And that was something that was also like, made me really want to be there too. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. oh, this is an option for when, you know, I want to hang up the, you know, the performance end of the work, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, uh, Axel was like, Hey, make something. And then I was like, you should make a movie. And I was like, Oh, uh, wh what, what do you mean? Like, what do you, a movie? And I was like, maybe I should start doing like a, uh, a, a gonzo movie. I'll do like, I'll shoot my own gonzo movie. I'll be, you know, Manuel does it and, uh, uh Mick's done it. It's like, you know, yeah. use the performance end of the value you've brought and work with girls that you have great chemistry with and create a, a project, you mm -hmm. know, a gonzo project. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, my first thing, it'll be, e I'll learn how to direct on a set. I'll mm -hmm. be performing in it. So I don't have to worry about the performance having an issue. Mm -hmm. Let me see how this goes. And um, uh, I guess Gamma had talked to Axel and, and, and said, hey, yeah, we, you know, we're totally fine with that. But like, couldn't he add some acting to it? Because he, you know, is very well known for it. So I'm like, yeah, I'm known, well known for acting, but I don't want to do a feature. I've never directed a day of yeah. my life. Yeah. And like, I want to actually get the feel of producing and directing a film that doesn't put that much pressure on me. Yeah, because shooting, whew, and directing it, a feature is a totally different ball animal. game than yeah, directing yeah, yeah. a gonzo. It's a totally different animal. Oh my but I God. wanted to actually just feel out being on a set. Yeah, so. and then, so sometimes I feel like uh, I need to make sure that I explain that my audience under knows what we're saying. So a feature movie is like a movie with a script and like various scenes and dialogue. It's like a story, right? And a gonzo film is generally just sex. There might be some kind of like tease. There could be like an implied story, but it's generally just a sex scene. So yeah, that's the difference in case you didn't know. So basically what had happened was is that they were like this acting and I was like, well, I had this really great idea and I was talking to a, another company producer about this a few years back and uh, Gonzo company and they were like, you can't do that. And I was like, what do you mean I can't do that? So it was this weird concept that I decided to do. Uh, I wanted to do like silent film, visual music video style videos that kind of tell like a visual story mm -hmm. and then it led into Gonzo style shot sex, but I never wanted the, uh, I want the lighting to stay consistent. So mm -hmm. as you know, in Gonzo movies, you look at a really like, you know, some of the, like the, some of the greatest Gonzo directors, like, you know, to me, the people I looked up to was like John Leslie and Johnny Darko and uh, Chris Streams. And you know what I mean? Like the, these guys just like perfected the art of Gonzo mm -hmm. shooting and sex style. I mean, Stagliano, obviously he's mm -hmm. the godfather of, of it. You know what I mean? Um, Jules Jordan. And Jamie Gillis, you know, Jamie Gillis as well. Yeah. And so is, but, um, so was uh, Seymour Butts, you know, yeah. the, all these guys did some really incredible things. Um, I'm really big in the history of the industry. It's always one like, I'm really into history of a lot of things, but I really want to know where I'm, where everything started and came from. Anyway, so I am a huge fan of, um, it, when it comes to industry stuff, I was a huge fan of your mom. I'm a huge fan of you. I was a huge fan of Andrew Blake. I was a huge fan of Michael Nin. These are like names that I really found interesting, mm -hmm. but I'm also... I love telling stories. Mm -hmm. It's just something I am. I'm a huge professional wrestling fan. Anybody who sees me on social media, I love wrestling. Really? I loved it since I was a kid. I didn't know I that. I love it. And I love the 
way to tell a story about something you know is predetermined, but the story around it and what comes around it can actually get someone invested into it and make that feels real is such an amazing, magical thing to do. And you know, it's so interesting. There's so many parallels between wrestling and porn. A hundred percent. Like so 100%. often. So it's I love, like, it's so similar. It's where my love for telling stories. I love yeah. it because at the end of the day too, like you think about it, right? You have a pre, you have this thing, these amazing athlete stunt men, you know, like they, it's like they're, they're doing these crazy stunts and it's the, the, the outcome's predetermined and they're not trying to like injure each other, but it's, it's an intense athletic event. Yeah. But the stories that they tell to get people invested, I mean, right now it's bigger than it's ever been right yeah. now. Um, but I've loved that. So I wanted to combine two things I love, which is telling story and this gonzo sex that I find to be the best type of sex that we can shoot in the industry. Um, uh, and I think it just tells them, it gives you that real chemistry and, and energy. It's something I really love. And I was able to combine the two mm -hmm. into one thing. And um, I'm sure people have played with it before. I don't believe I'm an original. I've said this in quotes and different interviews, uh, written interviews before. I believe that I'm playing with chemicals on a periodic table just a little differently. I don't mm -hmm. believe that these things weren't made yet. I'm not, I, but I, I was able to take something that I, I you know, I've, uh, I, I look at it, I call it cinema core. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much like this visual version of it. And we made our first movie. Um, I made my first movie called Red Room. Mm -hmm. Axel did come up with the, the red theme. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of told these visual stories of like sexy things like uh, that for that specific movie. Like Emily Willis was like, a, I was going to say Emily Willis started. Yeah, she right? was the lead. She was the main, the box cover girl. She was like this girl that just wasn't getting laid by her guy. And she like wanted to get fucked, but you could see her playing with her dildo or uh, like a butt plug. And then she starts masturbating. And there's this part where like sh I'm showering. You see a shower, but you don't see anybody in the shower, but you shower when she's like building to an orgasm. So it goes back and forth from her orgasm mm -hmm. in the shower, shower. And um, and then uh, I come in, there's like this visual argument and she's like, no motherfucker, you're fucking me. So it's like this idea and then it turns into like straight up gonzo shot scene, mm -hmm. except the lighting stays pretty inconsistent because a lot of times it's this really amazing intro. Mm -hmm. And then the idea gonzo has always been like, we want to make sure the skin tones look really well. So it's more sure, of a- You can see the penetration. It's very sterile. No shadows. It's a very sterile thing and that's totally fine. I think yeah. that's a beautiful, but I wanted to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I just felt it would be really cool to be like, you're still in the world. Mm -hmm you're not being taken out of that world. Like, so yeah. if I'm in the cinematic world, I can still shoot the same style and I, I have figured out a way to light it so I don't get shadows. Mm -hmm. And it's also, cause it's, it's just a massive diffusion. Mm -hmm. And then I can still get that cinematic feel and look with that same style of sex. Mm -hmm. So, and it did really well, mm -hmm. like really well in consideration for the market we're in now. Mm -hmm. And then um, that was the beginning of it. And then they were like, hey, do you want to make this featurette? And I was like, sure. And we called it deranged. Mm -hmm. And after three, uh, Axel and the team, Jessica and Dom were like, what happens next? And I was like, I don't know. Do you want to see? And then we decided to make it an eight scene movie. Mm -hmm. And then Privilege, we just made an eight scene epic. Mm -hmm. And Reckless, which the cool thing about those three films is that I was able to create my own cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. So I have these like 24 episodes. Well, 25 actually, because Reckless had a bonus. But that was a bonus of a sex scene of a montage that I actually made the sex scene for. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give them like a bonus. Like it wasn't necessary, but it was cool. So characters from Derange, Derange is like the Game of Thrones of it. Mm -hmm. And then Privilege and Reckless are happening simultaneously. But like you could see the past of Deranged characters come are in the movie of Reckless. And then like Privilege characters are crossing over into Reckless. And then it kind of, it's all, they all interweave. Mm -hmm. So I made these three movies that are completely separate. Like you wouldn't have to watch one to know the other. Mm -hmm. But if you watch them all, it actually makes it like this really cool thing. And That's I thought awesome. that was something that really had never been done yeah. within like three separate projects. Like you've seen people do sequels and trilogies, but these are three separate stories about three separate worlds of, of uh, assembled people, but adding in people from the same world, but different worlds. Yeah. And I just found that to be super interesting than and you know unless you pay attention or watched all of them you wouldn't even know but it's my own thing that i did that's really cool i don't know anybody else who's done anything like yeah, that yeah so i i found that to be really and then from there those did those those seem to have done well and um i just got a fucking bug for it I yeah guess. yeah so what is your uh what do you find the most rewarding thing about directing i mean seeing it done um that's the best part when it's yeah, edited when and you get edited, to like sit like, down oh, and watch amazing. it. Amazing. Um, but honestly, like I just want to bring, we're in a world right now. And I think the reason why it, it works so well now and like, I feel like everything's timing and like 
I do believe everything happens when it's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, not when I think it's supposed to happen. Yes. <laughs> just to clarify. Yeah, that, that there's a big difference. It just happens when <laughs> it's supposed to. Right. And um, I believe that right now we're in a time period where talent have a little more control mm -hmm. of their careers. Than they yeah, have. You know, for sure. The, back in, you know, the time period that I came up in, you had to become a performer based on the right companies and directors hiring you, being paired with the right talent. And that was how your name got built as mm -hmm. a male or female or whatever it was, you know, basically you built a name if you were on a ton of box covers, if you were a girl, mm -hmm. it had nothing to do. And if those box covers sold and then you, you'd become a star and you, your people watched you. Nowadays, you can, you have all the aspects and avenues to build your brand without anything but yourself. Yeah. You social media, you have OnlyFans, you have tons of different prop, or, you know, whatever, all these different type of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I, I wanted to, I think one thing that I feel is like, it still exists, but it's not as much of is like porn. Porn is veered into more of a sexy isn't the main prerogative of it. Mm. Like the of the majority of adult films, they were not uh, adult content. It's not when it comes to mainstream adult. It's like the there wasn't as much. I just saw there wasn't as much of like like you know you look at some of the older nineties two thousand stuff. It was like really about just women being sexy and mm -hmm. things like that. And I wanted to. I wanted to add my own take on that and I wanted to add my own take on storytelling. And I think seeing the talent excited about that and they're part of it and they're like, this is so exciting and they really want to do it. And then they watching their light come on of mm -hmm. like, this is, oh my God, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. That is where I get the most joy. Yeah. At. What's the most difficult thing about directing? Oh my God, production. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is something that a lot of people don't know. Yeah. In the adult industry, you don't get to just be a director. If you're a director, you're also the producer yeah. like you do all the yeah. work it's not like you just get to show up to set and you're like okay like what's the script and i get to do that you know what i mean like yeah. it's like you put that thing to you you use you often write the scripts yeah you put together the production schedule you hire the talent it's like it's a whole you do the payroll you have to fucking write the checks yep. handle the paperwork everything yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's so that's that's really the most difficult part about it. Also, I'm OCD and like I really care about my films and the intricacies and the, the little things that I want to add to them that make I feel like that I feel make them special for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had to learn how to be OK with certain things like, yeah, you know what I mean, like be like yeah. that. I can't do that. Like yeah. I can't I don't have enough for that, but I can make it happen this way mm -hmm. or I can do this. It's just like playing, you know, Jenga. Mm -hmm. with everything it's yeah. just a lot of work and also um uh i learned a lot about ego in myself and we i struggle with you know we all struggle with that journey all the time we all yeah. have ego yeah uh but dealing with a lot of different personalities and egos yeah and learning how to uh, play within that net on mm -hmm. a regular basis and making sure that uh one thing that's really important to me as a director is um and i say this all the time it's like i think we're in the best time in the industry for consensual work like mm. i think most most we're very on top of it like on my sets on especially on gamma sets you don't even on all set most sets that i work on at least and where i'm directing or producing it's like knowing people's boundaries knowing what they're okay with knowing what they're not okay with giving them a free space to feel okay to speak up about whatever those things are that always comes first mm -hmm. but to me also what i also put want to feel like i need to put first is like i want them to feel taken care of i yeah. want that i want to give every girl on my set contract girl treatment Mm -hmm. I don't care who it is. I don't care what it is. I just feel that I want them to feel like, hey, like we're mutually bringing value together and I want them to feel like it's it's special that we're doing this thing together. And mm -hmm. that's really and I have a lot of my crew is just at this point in time is just incredible. We have a great symbiotic relationship and they all know that's the energy I'm trying to bring and they all bring that too. And it's just um, being able to cultivate sets like that is really important to me, yeah. especially as a whole to this industry. Because yeah. that's not always been that way. You know what I mean? And I just, I find that I have been privileged with the responsibility and the honor to be able to do this part of the job. And I want to be able to cultivate more positive experiences that are like, not just positive experiences, but exciting experiences. Yeah. And if I can, though, that is the best part about this job because that is really the legacy I want to leave. I mean, I know it's probably one of those stupid little Instagram quotes you see on your feed, but it's like, you know, you leave this earth with, how you make people feel. Yeah. You know? I think about that Maya Angelou quote all the time you know? where it's like people forget, will forget like the things that you did or the things that you said, but yeah. they will never forget the way that you made them feel. Yeah. Because and that is like so true. And I think as someone like. I think it was Maya Angelou. Yeah. 
And I think someone if like it wasn't you. cut it cut that out. <laughs> I'm pretty fucking sure it was. <laughs> I think like people like you and me who've like kind of like you know played with death to a degree. Yeah, um, yeah. When you really get grounded at the best times and moments, mm -hmm. you start realizing what truly matters. Yeah, that's really what matters to me. Yeah, yeah. So, um, speaking of things that matter. Uh, you were married to fellow performer Kenzie Taylor. Yes. Um, who is also sober. Yes. Uh, is having a relationship where both people work in the adult industry difficult? And if there are some difficulties, is it more about business getting mixed up together? Or are there ever like any elements of jealousy? Um, I mean, we're human. So mm -hmm. things happen. Uh, we have a pretty good like locked on down on the fact that like, like we both knew what we got ourselves into mm -hmm. when we got together about like that part of the industry or whatever. Like we know we both work in the adult. Like mm -hmm. we both know we are screwing other people for yeah. work. Yeah. Um, I think it's just communication is yeah. really key to everything. I, I don't think, uh, uh, I think from a business level, like I'm sure, I'm sure people find me to be a overachiever. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm an overachiever. I just have, I'm a survivalist. Mm -hmm. So like I, I grew up with nothing. Like a lot of a lot of times in my life, I was homeless. I had nothing. I, I things before I got in the industry, I, I went through really tough tough times in my life. So, I kind of been conditioned to just like try to get everything out of. I want to make sure I could be get as much out of life as I possibly can from you know mm -hmm. every type of success I can do personally, for, you know, professionally, whatever it is. And I think I think she is a very competitive person. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know she's always striving for that, and I think that makes us better. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like we all we both are always striving to be the best we can. So I yeah. think sometimes that can make us butt heads, but I do feel that it makes us both better. So Yeah, I mean, that. I think my husband and I are really like great and symbiotic partners, but man, if we worked in the same industry. It's tough. That's the toughest oh, part. Oh, 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 that would be bad. Yeah. Like that would be that would not be a well, good She was idea. An, she was an athlete too. I was both we have that competitive nature. Yeah. So let's say in the day, like for her, it's like, you know, it's like I'm going for them fun. And she's a very motivated person. Yeah. You know I mean, but sometimes it's like you know, I, like you said, like early in the thing, it's like I've, I've accomplished a lot. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, it's not even her. It's more like it's learning how to, to wipe out the bullshit of what other people say. Yeah. Like, it's like, it doesn't matter what we do. It mm -hmm. matters of, do we attach to what other people's opinions and perspectives are? And I think right. that's where the issue comes in an adult because of our small world. Yeah. If you can be in a relationship and you both have like that, 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 really connection thing and it's like mm -hmm. all the outside voices are like okay mm -hmm. we've been dealing with this for how long we know that's what these people what everybody does and yeah that's the that's the only struggle of it i think yeah um some feedback that i see a lot from my audience is you know a lot of people have a really hard time imagining being in a relationship with somebody who has sex with other people for a living even if you are also doing that thing i think the one perk about being a performer um and having sex for a living is that that stops being the main prerogative of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people don't get to experience that. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we, we, uh, at least I, during my time in finding relationships in general with anybody outside of the work base of this job mm -hmm. is trying to find some form of emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, I think that is what, really is the part that we focus on the most yeah like what is the emotional connection what is the bond yeah like sex is just like when we come together and have sex there's an emotional aspect to it like to on a deeper level it's not you know or even anything we do is an emotional connection on a level there it's like you know when you go to work and you do any type of performance or whatever it is you find a connection but it's like having the ability if you have the if, if you're <laughs> If you're having sex on camera and you're falling in love every single time you're on camera, like legitimately falling in love, then you might not be in the right business. <laughs> I'm just put it that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, I get like having a moment of it, like, wow, this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when you're done, you're like, oh my God, order. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like. Um, okay. All right, Seth. So tell us about your newest production company, Lucid Flix. So I, I can make this brief. So I, I, did, um, I did want to create something that was kind of an off source of. Um, you know, I was making a lot of stuff with Wicked, but I wanted to try to do something that was like, you know, uh, my own, especially like from a future perspective, having something that I could create. Like I had a space that I 
felt like I could play into and stuff like that and having a um, couple, couple of my own genres and kind of creating like an HBO Max-esque type site. It has mm-hmm. like more of a network feel of a uh, streaming network that has like some of my favorite genres kind of doing those things like, you know, doing featurettes, feature films. This, I did kind of added a voyeuristic POV line to it that I really wanted to play into because so I- So it's a bunch of kind of like different genres with all the same feel. I don't Makes know if they all have the same feel. They're just all very cinematic. And every movie is like its own thing. I know if you, if anybody who watches my products, like I think the thing about me is nothing's the same. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Nothing is the same. Like the cinema core stuff, uh, it all has a similar idea and identity, but every movie has its own identity. So I'm still creating things from like a movie perspective. So it's like, here's this, here's this film with these four scenes, but I'm still staying in that genre mm-hmm. of that genre so it's yeah like, but you're still getting each movie has its own theme of that genre right so yeah so there's all these different ones so it's like uh there's voyeuristic pov thing where i'm kind of like voyeuring a girl in real life situations but i'm shooting it like it looks like film mm-hmm. so as opposed to it looking like amateur based mm-hmm. it looks like you're following someone through like you know the uh, took chanel cameron through the pier mm-hmm. um i I, uh, I, Eliza Barr was like doing a workout at like a nice gym and mm-hmm. you can kind of like you're watching her and she kind of like comes on to you and wants to view her. And then the sex, I kind of split up between like POV and regular so the mm-hmm. audience can get like third person and POV. Mm-hmm. And then there's the cinema core stuff. And then uh, as you know, with uh, Jeff, we've been doing uh, these things. I created another line called Lucid Shorts, which is like, like thematic movies with like singular featurettes in between them, uh, mm-hmm. short version. And then obviously I'll do a feature here and there for it. But generally it's just having my own world of what I find unique about my own cinematic insanity that goes through my brain and working with people like, you know, Sign Obscura and Jeff and, uh, you know, my lighting squad and making, creating things and eventually building a platform to where um, people I, I, you know, have relationships with that I feel we can work together with and have ideas. I can create a place for them to be able to create it without any net, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's really what I've created. So I call it Lucid Flicks. It does feel like a max it has that kind of energy to it. And everything's really well thought out. And every every talent that I work with, I cultivate the idea around them and with them. So Which I think is ideal. And a lot of people don't do that. And yeah. that's actually the way that we always used to shoot people. Like, that's kind of what I learned from my mom. Yeah. It was always about like, okay, who's the talent? What makes sense for them? As well, opposed I, I to taking from... a theme and being, and like trying to stick it on anybody. Like that doesn't work. No, no. So everything is like, I, you know, it's like girl cancels, scenes canceled. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. there's no... Unfortunately, that's just how it is because at the end of the day, it's like I want to make sure I'm making something that that is catered around mm-hmm. what – and I want to give you the idea and be like, oh, yeah, I love that idea and this is something we could do together and make something yeah. incredibly awesome. So it's just important to me. You know, How long have you been filming for this? Like how long have I you started been filming in May. Okay. Uh, we launched December 20th. So how many scenes have you shot for it? Uh, 23. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's a lot. And I did, I, you know, obviously launching a site, how do I spend the least amount of money? Yeah. I fucked for free. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's the unfair advantage that you have. I could never like put myself in my own movies to like save on performer. And, and it's not even like I'm doing it. It's like, look, don't get me wrong. I love being a performer. Yeah. But like, I, yeah, I'm trying to like, do totally. I don't mind doing some of it, but like, all of it, sometimes it gets a little... I was going to say, like, is it hard to direct and perform in your own movie? It's a little more complicated. Like, that's a lot. But it is it is and it isn't. Yeah. Because, like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I know exactly what I'm going to do. Um, usually I came up with whatever the thing is, like, 90% of the time. So it's in my brain of what I came up with. So who's going to know it better than me? Right. Um, and but it is it is I, I like it both ways. I really do. It's just a little the only thing that gets a struggle sometimes there might be a few shots that weren't exactly the way I wanted them because mm-hmm. I wasn't behind the monitor at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that other than that, I feel like it's not I, I've built enough people where they know my weird intricacies and obsessions mm-hmm. that they'll be like they get it. Yeah. You know, from a visual perspective. It's right, right, storytelling. Right. I make sure even when I'm on camera, like I'm always working with the actor to make sure that they have the acting down. So, yeah. And I don't put like generally speaking, I'm pretty methodical on how I put myself in something like okay like with reckless like I was in reckless I was in a feature that I wrote directed led in the movie so technically I was like a supporting lead in the movie right so how in the script I'm in the beginning I'm in prison and then I'm in the end Mm. so I was able to shoot in one day two days all of my shit out 
then mm-hmm. the other seven days of the movie, I think it was, because it was like a nine-day movie, mm-hmm. I wasn't in the movie at all. Yeah. So I was like very methodical on like, how do I get my shit out of the way? Mm-hmm. So I, my part's done, and then do it this way. And then you can focus on everything you, yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. So that way, that's compartmentalized. So I was like, okay, these two days, I'm going to I'm gonna do this part, and then the rest of the movie, I'm going to make sure of this. So yeah. I try to organize it in a way where if to you know make sure I built value or it's something that you know a female wants to we want to work together and also in in one of the projects that I make um, I try to write it in a way where it's not going to be too stressful or overwhelming for me yeah yeah no that makes sense all right well Seth thank you so much for coming on yes it's such a pleasure to um, connect with you again and then if you're a member of our Patreon um, I have a couple of questions for you that some guys sent me if you don't mind Let's bang all these out yeah. um, but that's going to be in a separate little oh, several video so um for now seth can you tell everybody where they can find you online and also your uh website you can find me on different social medias one is <laughs> twitter it is at seth gamble triple x there's a chance i might be shadow banned which most of us are so if you search at seth gamble xxx and you look at latest or and you go down you might be able to click it and do that or it might come up that day Depends on the day. Depends on the day of the week. So I just want to announce that part. Uh, Instagram is at Seth Gamble PS. Um, uh, some friends like to say Seth Gamble lips, but it's just Seth Gamble PS. And it's <laughs> one. That's what it is. Um, I haven't really updated very often, but you can find me on TikTok. Uh, official Seth Gamble. Um, and uh, please, uh, if you haven't yet, please come and check out lucidflix.com uh, for some of the newest content out there. Um, you can also find me, I'm, you know, uh, the main place that I mostly am is adulttime.com. Wicked.com are the places that, you know, I lay my head at and, you know, is, the, is my team and my family. So please check me out in all those different places. Always some new stuff coming out. Uh, pretty sure this episode will be some on some of those places. So check us out soon. And thank you for having me, Holly. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, I do have a podcast channel on adult time. So this will actually be on adult time. Um, and you can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And of course, uh, if go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filter to watch these episodes live and get access to the bonus Q and A's that we're about to do. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week. Bye.